Good afternoon and thanks for joining us. I'm Judy Simpson. Well, many things change as we age. In general, our bodies slow down and we are less physically and mentally flexible. Memory changes occur as well. And for some, Alzheimer's disease and other forms of dementia take hold. For Alzheimer's patients and their caregivers, the challenges are enormous, especially when it comes to end of life care. So this afternoon, we're gonna discuss hospice care for someone who has a dementia diagnosis. Nationally, dementia is the top non-cancer diagnosis for patients patients who receive hospice care. Nonetheless, many families facing advanced stages of dementia illness do not access hospice care or they learn about it very late. So to learn about accessing hospice care at a proper time, I'm joined by two guests. Kelly Freidinger Didula is a registered nurse who specializes in hospice care with the Visiting Nurse Association of Chittenden and Grand Isle Counties. Also with me is Jesse Cornell. Jesse is the Community Outreach Specialist with the Alzheimer's Association Vermont Chapter. Thanks so much for being with us today. Thank you. And so, um, Kelly, let me ask you to start by talking about what hospice care is. Sure. Hospice care is a multidisciplinary team approach to providing care for a person with life, a life-limiting illness. Um, we also help families through that transition as well. We focus on quality and comfort during the end of their life, um, taking into consideration all of their physical, emotional, and spiritual needs. Mm -hmm. And so what is the primary goal of hospice care? Primary goal is to provide both the patient and their family with the highest quality of life through whatever they have left of their life. Um, it's to um, provide interventions for comfort um, and safety, mm -hmm. as well as helping the family through this. Would a person with dementia qualify for hospice care? Absolutely. Um, <clears throat> we actually take care of many people with dementia through our hospice program at the VNA. Um, and what we need to see is um, a decrease in their level of functioning, usually. Mm -hmm. um, when somebody is referred for hospice care, we need to have a um, doctor give us a certification of a terminal illness of six months or less. And sometimes that can be hard with people with dementia, but we do have specific things that we can look at to determine if they meet those qualifications. Mm -hmm. And is this something that can be done in a home setting or? Absolutely, it can be done either in a home setting or a facility setting. Mm -hmm. um, either one is appropriate and we see patients with dementia in both of those places. Can you give us some more details about the services that are typically provided by sure. hospice care? There are a lot of services provided by hospice care. So you have generally a, a physician mm -hmm. who is the attending physician directing care. You have access to a skilled nurse who comes and visits weekly and as needed to assess what's going on with the person and what we can do for interventions to provide their comfort. Um, you have access to a social worker who is a great support for the family and sometimes the patient as well, acts as a counselor or can discuss things like um, um, further planning care needs for in the future, um, talk about advanced directives and things like that. Um, we also have uh, licensed nurse assistants who can provide personal care assistance to somebody, which would include bathing and dressing, and that's generally a few times a week for about an hour at a time. We have volunteers. We have a huge pool of volunteers at the VNA, which is fabulous. And they can come in a couple of times a week for a few hours at a time and provide both companionship to the person as well as respite for the caregivers, which is very important. So if they need to leave to go take care of errands or they have something they really need to attend to, they are comfortable doing that knowing that there will be somebody there with their loved one, which is fantastic. We have hospice chaplains, which can help with spiritual needs. We also have a homemaker service, which can come in and help with cleaning and some light cooking, um, grocery mm -hmm. shopping as well. We have um, PT, OT, and speech to come in and help with those needs. And then um, what else do we have? Um, we have 
uh, we can provide medical supplies if the patient needs medical supplies. We provide durable medical, equi medical equipment such as hospital beds, bedside commodes, wheelchairs, walkers, um, home oxygen, and then any medication that's related either to the terminal diagnosis or to the person's comfort um, is covered generally under the hospice benefit. And so how can viewers contact their local VNA? Sure. So the local VNA can be contacted. Um, it's the VNA of Chittenden Grand Isle Counties. The website is www.vnacares.org slash hospice. Or they can call 802-860-4410. For all of Vermont, there is a way to contact outside of Chittenden Grand Isle Counties. That's www.vnavermont. VT, sorry, <laughs> dot org, and the toll-free number there is 855-484-3862. Let's uh, talk to Jesse now and bring you into the discussion. In general, you know, it's really hard to talk about dying and end-of-life care, but planning is really essential. It is critical, Judy, you're right, especially with a diagnosis like Alzheimer's disease or another form of dementia, because what we want to do is start talking about these conversations early on to allow for the person themselves with the diagnosis to be part of that conversation. We find that not only does it empower the person living with the diagnosis, but it also helps to smooth the way for families when they have to make those tough decisions. If the person themselves has made the decisions in advance, it takes the pressure off of trying to figure out what we would want to do when they can no longer share that information with us. Right, and I mean, and it's, a, it's a critical time for families too because you have all these emotions kind of swirling around, you know, when you get that diagnosis that the word can be somewhat overwhelming for folks. Right, and you know, it, it is overwhelming, but what we need to do is to sit with that sense of fear and isolation and then get the courage to move forward and have these difficult discussions. Nobody wants to have them, nobody wants to talk about dying, but it is a fact of life and how best can we make that a quality of life a component. Mm -hmm. uh, well, it's interesting. I mean, we plan for everything else. <laughs> right. We do. We truly do. So let's let's talk about this because it's not so terrible, really, when we look at how we can come together and support one another through a difficult situation. We've done that in all of our transitions through life. What are some of those um, decisions that need to be made as far as making plans? What are some of the things that people should be thinking about? Sure. Early on, we definitely need to be taking care of the legal and financial um, elements of being an adult. So after age 18, we should all have a health care proxy. We should all have a durable power of attorney um, and someone who when you make those decisions and appoint those people making sure that you're having detailed conversations about what your your plans are if you were unable to dictate how your medical care was going to look what do you want what do you not want and so how can family members and caregivers connect with a loved one who is in the later stages of dementia or Alzheimer's? The later stages of dementia or Alzheimer's are traditionally difficult for families to um, feel connection because of the loss of the ability to verbally communicate. So we so often rely on that verbal communication. What we need to look at are the nonverbal signs making sure that we're having um, physical connection with our loved one. We should not underestimate the power of touch. Um, so touch with um, lotions and scents, um, brushing someone's hair, stroking the cheek, patting a shoulder or a knee, hugs. Um, I have seen plenty of families that actually lay down next to their loved one in the bed or in the chair because it brings us a sense of comfort mm -hmm. to be together. Um, playing music that your loved one always loved or reading passages from favorite books or um, uh, uh, scripture, those are, are beautiful ways to connect. And those, I mean, everybody's different, obviously, mm -hmm. so you can never really tell what's going to, to connect one person with another, but those are obviously great ideas. Those are some generals, and I can say, you know, when my great-grandmother had dementia in, in stages, I, as a little girl, I would climb into bed with her, and I would always bring in tomatoes and garden dirt, because that's how I remembered her. <laughs> she was always in the kitchen garden. So mm -hmm. that sensation um, is really important, and that smell of something that was once very important to that person probably still is. And so end-of-life issues can spur some family conflicts, too. What are some tips for bringing families together during this tough time? Oh, transitions are so hard on families no matter what. But when we're talking about end-of-life issues, it just gets that much harder. Um, so coming to the table and being willing to listen to all perspectives before passing judgment, I think, is a very simple statement, but it's really difficult in practice. Um, I often suggest to families that you put the goal right in the center of the table, written down, and the goal is to increase the comfort of our loved one that we're, we're watching pass. And if we can focus on that as our goal, 
the way we all look to get there might be a little bit different, but in the end, if we have the same unifying goal, it'll help us to begin to talk about how we're gonna get there. Mm -hmm. And is it tough too when you have family members in different parts of the country? Oh, absolutely. Those long distance telephones um, are a blessing in the sense that that can sometimes give us the space we need if conversations are particularly difficult. It's recognizing when we need to pause and come back to the conversation. Um, for someone that's living far away, it's hard to see the everyday changes that may be leading the family that's present, physically present to the decisions that they're making. Um, so it's again pausing and trying to see the whole picture no matter where you are. Mm -hmm. And so where and how can viewers get information from the Alzheimer's Association? Absolutely. ALZ.org is a fantastic place to visit. Our Caregiver Resource Center um, goes through the different stages of Alzheimer's disease and dementia and beautifully illustrates how you can connect with a loved one or you can call our 24-hour helpline at 800-272-3900. And so Kelly, what expenses are involved in hospice care? Sure, um, I think that's a question that's great because I think a lot of families are intimidated when they think about what is this going to cost me. The good news is that uh, if you have Medicare or Medicaid, all of your hospice services are covered 100% under those two programs. Most private, private insurances these days also have a very good hospice benefit. Um, we do have people that unfortunately don't have either Medicare, Medicaid, or insurance, um, and most, if not all, hospices do have a sliding fee scale so that we can have access for everybody um, and not leave anyone out. It's a very important service, I think, at end of life. Are people surprised at sort of um, how flexible the service can be? I think people are, are surprised by the amount of support they can receive. Mm -hmm. um, when I start listing off all of the different services we can pull in to help support the person and their loved ones, I think sometimes they feel overwhelmed. Mm -hmm. um, but at the same time, I think they're very grateful when they find out that they have all of these different people and services and support that can be provided to them. And so how does a family know when it's time to start asking about hospice services or, or what does late stage Alzheimer's look sure. like? Well, my suggestion in terms of asking about hospice services, um, especially when we're talking about dementia, mm -hmm. is that I would recommend talking about that with the person on their diagnosis mm -hmm. when they can still communicate what their wishes and desires might be at the end of life. I think that's very important. So as early as possible is when I would start talking about it. In terms of when is it appropriate for hospice services to come in, again, I think that's something we have to look at in terms of where your loved one is. Mm -hmm. If they're having symptoms that are bothersome, whether it be pain, whether it be increased restlessness or agitation, um, whether it be shortness of breath, whatever that might be, I think it's important that if you think there needs to be more done around their comfort, that it's time to start looking into hospice services. And again, anybody can make a referral for hospice, which is fantastic. So you as a granddaughter, daughter, son, mm -hmm. grandson, whoever you might be, it doesn't have to be a physician that makes that referral. Uh, we do need a physician involvement eventually, but you yourself can make a referral and we can come in and do just an evaluation to see what we feel if this person is appropriate for our services. And once again, hospice care allows individuals to remain at home and receive care? Absolutely, yep. Um, one of the goals for many people is to die at home and we fully support that goal. So we do everything we can to support that person and their family through this transition at home if that's where they desire to be. Um, but for some people, obviously, that, that can't happen. Right. Um, so the VNA does have a respite house in Williston, so that's one option. There are people that we have in facilities throughout the county mm -hmm. that we also see. And so it's quite possible for us to come in and provide this sort of care and this level of care within a skilled nursing facility and a memory care unit. Mm -hmm. um, and we do see quite a, quite a few people in those situations. And Jesse, tell us again, we've got about a minute left, um, the importance of families sitting down and having these conversations before you know you go too far down the road. Yeah, it's critical to have the conversations um, all along the way because variables are gonna change. Um, so even if you have this beautifully crafted plan right from the get-go, we have to be on our toes and willing to think and respond quickly. And I think that's one of the greatest things about the hospice service is that um, it allows the family to stay in the family role 
and not always be the manager of care. And really, at the end stage of life, isn't that what we want for each other, is to spend quality time and, and connect instead of navigating the healthcare care system? Mm -hmm. um, and hospice complements that family system really, really well. So Kelly, before we go, can you sure. mind our viewers how they can get more information about accessing sure. hospice care? So for VNA of Chittenden and Grand Isle counties, if you live in those counties, you can access us through www.vnacares.org slash hospice or you can contact us via our phone number, which is 802-860-4410. For the rest of Vermont, it's www.vnavt.org. Toll-free number is 855-484-3862. Well, I want to thank you both for joining me today. It's important information. Thank you. Thank you Judy. That's our program for today. I'm Judy Simpson. We'll see you again next time on Across the Fence. Oh,